So I wanted to be a priest because I wanted souls to be saved. I memorized what the Pope said. If you remember back, if you're old enough to remember back to the war days and uh, Pius XII, he wrote a famous encyclical called Mystici Corpus, The Body of Christ. And he said to sacrifice and to pray so that souls could be saved because that's what the Pope said. And so I wanted to be a priest so that I could suffer for sin. Um, it was part of our tradition. We, would, we wouldn't eat um, candy and we wouldn't take Coca-Cola or sweet drinks during Lent or Advent. We were always offering things up you know, for souls in purgatory and that people would have grace. So we were, it was part of my being brought up as a Catholic from Ireland. It's the same in the South American countries and in the Philippines and in the Latin American countries. The American Catholics aren't big on sacrificing, in case you didn't know. Uh, uh, but it's part of Catholicism and it was very much part of my desire to be a priest. Uh, I bought a Bible when I was going into the, into the Dominican order thinking we were going to study the Bible. And uh, the first year was all devotionals and lives of the saints and meditations and ways of the cross and mass and different sacraments. And there was, the Bible is read under the different traditional saints, you know, in the mass, but it's not, it wasn't studied. And then we began formal study. The first three years was studying Aristotle, a pagan 300 years before Christ. Greek philosophy is what every single priest is taught. At least for two years, I had three years of philosophy. I still can give by memory different uh, sayings and dictums and principles from Aristotle. I still know it, but memorized it. My first three years were in, in the logic and the cosmology and the metaphysics of Aristotle. And then we began four years of studying theology of Thomas Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas is based on the Bible, on tradition, on what the popes have said, and what the philosopher said. He doesn't even call him Aristotle, he just calls him the philosopher. He quotes scripture and he quotes the philosopher. And it was lethal stuff that we were being taught in those four years. Catholic tradition by a most learned theologian, Thomas Aquinas. And we did study uh, actually Greek and Hebrew, which I'm thankful for. But um, we studied an introduction to the Bible as a minor subject. And in that we studied uh, what's called higher criticism, form criticism, and redaction criticism, particularly Rudolf Bootmann, liberal Protestant writers trying to show myths in the Bible and trying to get you to not really trust the Bible. It was lethal stuff, but it was throwing us back into the arms of Mother Church. That was the, my introduction to the Bible was more to turn you off believing in the Bible using liberal Protestant scholars. All my time in preparing for the priesthood, I was still very devout. It was not just I memorized what the Pope said about suffering. I memorized now what Mary was supposed to have said at Fatima. Mary is supposed to be appearing. And what she said at Fatima, was that many souls go to hell because there's nobody to pray or do penance for them. People are being sent to hell because nobody is willing to suffer or do penance for them. And I decided to become even more devout. I got permission from the master of students to make a whip, I used to take off my priestly gown, you know, my habit and my undershirt and I would what they call flagellate yourself, that's whip yourself. Now I had read the saints where they did it to blood. I never did it to blood. <laughs> I did it so I couldn't stand the pain anymore. I uh, 
took cold showers in the dead of winter. Dublin is as far north as Moscow and it gets really cold in the winter. And I would stand in the shower till my bones were nearly, <laughs> you know, cracking. I was just experiencing pain and offering my pain with Christ's pain and with Christ's suffering so that souls could be saved. And I had walked with little stones in my shoes and little penances like that. And I was intent that souls would be saved because that's what, what my whole ambition was. When I look at some photographs of myself back then, I looked like a Gestapo agent. I was, <laughs> man, I was intent. I was so serious in keeping the rules. I was so serious to to want to be a good priest. And I was a bit shocked that there was only about 10% of us who were really taking it seriously. Most of the men training for the priesthood were, were just going into it. And it, was, it, it used to really bother me and some of the other really devout students that there were, there were not many of us who were so intent, but I was one of those who was intent in leading Catholicism. I was ordained a priest in 1963 and I had did so well in my studies for the priesthood that I qualified to be sent to Rome, Italy. I was looking forward to going to the holy city. We always talked about Rome as the holy city. This was the headquarters of the Catholicism where the Pope lived. lived. I was going to see St. Peter's and the Vatican. When I got to Rome, after a few days, I was so disheartened. It was the immorality. And then in the classroom where we had 300 students, I was horrified by the, the behavior and the talk and the attitudes of the 300 students. It was like they were trying to get high-flying degrees in the Catholic Church, but they weren't interested in, in you know, in in living Catholicism, they just wanted a position, and it was, it, it, it really, really bothered me. I was very shocked by the life in Rome and the immorality and the, the whole veneer and the way the, we used to get jeered in the buses and on the street because we wore the black and white Dominican habit and uh, the, the, the Catholic youth used to jeer us, you know. Uh, we used to curse them back in Gaelic, you know, we have our own Irish language. <laughs> I knew some good curse words in Gaelic, so uh, we used to say some things to them as they would uh, call us beetles, you know, black beetles and things like that because of our gowns. And we would say some... Uh, some words them in the Gaelic language. Uh, but it was, it was a real horrific year. I left Rome early. I finished at a normal degree. I, I, I quit the two degrees I was supposed to do and finished at the ordinary academic level. And I wanted to be cleansed of my year in Rome and I went back by Lourdes, Fatima. Lourdes, Mary was supposed to have appeared and t told you to suffer for your sins. And I went into the pool where people went to be healed, and people going with cancer wounds and mucus, you know, coming out of their body and all sort of horrific things in the water, you know. And I took the water up in my hand and I drank it. It was one of the more horrific penances I've ever done in my life. And uh, I was doing it so that I could be good and purified by my suffering and that I would be purified from my year in Rome and be brought back to being a devout Catholic and a devout Catholic priest. So that was my trip to Lourdes in France. It's a, an amazing place. The, the atmosphere is electric. It's, it's, a, it's really preternatural. It's, it's a, you've got to go to these apparition sites to really experience what what Catholicism is about. We have some here in the States, with Denver, uh, uh, Conyers, Atlanta, and um, 
Lubbock, Texas are just some of the three famous sites where Mary is supposed to appear in the States. But you've really got to go to these places to, to sense the preternatural and uh, things really strange. And um, I went back to Ireland and then I was sent to Trinidad, West Indies. I was to be a Catholic missionary priest. I landed in the tropics and the first time I was really warm in my life was when I was... <laughs> I never could stand the Irish climate and it was like Trinidad was made for me. It was gloriously warm all year round. And I liked the people, the real friendly people. And then I started uh, baptizing babies and hearing confessions. We used to do it for three hours on a Saturday then we'd have supper for an hour and we'd go back from seven to eight and do a, a fourth hour. I would sweat profusely and it wasn't just because it was tropics. It was being right close to somebody there just as a grill and there they are pouring out the sins on you. It's like sitting in a dumpster with garbage being poured on you. But this is intimate details of people's sins and it was, it was frightening. You know, I would see sweat sometimes on ladies' lips here and just on their cheekbones. They were embarrassed telling me what their sins were. And I would say, I, I absolve you from all your sins in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In those days, I said it in Latin. And it was frightening because they would come back week after week with the same sins. And even from the beginning, I was wondering, why is this, you know? We have the power to forgive sins, and why do people keep coming back? Why do they keep coming back? Why do the priests make such jokes about it in the rum shop at night? Why are the priests themselves so flippant about it? Why is it so few of us take it seriously? And then baptizing babies, even my first few years, was really hard. The priests used to joke about it. Say we, we don't ever see them again. If we do see them, we see them for a few years. But uh, one priest said, we hatch, match, and dispatch. I, I said, what? Yeah, he says, we hatch them at baptism, and those who do get married, we match them at marriage, and we dispatch them at funerals. We hatch, match, and dispatch. I said, I said behave yourself, you know, and he said, and he, I, I, I was really scandalized he was so flippant. He said, that's what our job is. He said, the hardest part is the hatching. We don't see them again. And if, if we had about 6 to 8% of, you know, so-called Catholics, um, people practicing. It was like South America, not like the States, where there is a fair percentage, even though it keeps going down, but, or not like Ireland or the American, the Latin American countries, very few people actually practice Catholicism. And the same in the West Indies. So it was really hard, even from the beginning, but I devoutly did it, and I still was doing my sacrifices to be a good priest. And then, in 1972, turn around in my life, I had a freak accident where I split the back of my head and damaged my back spine. I was three days unconscious and I was so close to death that it's, it's frightening even to think of it. And when I did regain consciousness, I was in such mental and physical pain because of where I damaged on my skull and my back spine. It was agony mental and physical agony when I came to consciousness. When I was sufficiently conscious enough to really begin to reason what had happened about four months later when I got out of a sanatorium, I wondered if I died where I would have gone. I used to boast I was such a good priest I never committed a mortal sin. That's a serious sin. But I never had peace with God. Where would I have gone? Uh, it, it, I really struggled. Where would I have gone? And so I started studying the Bible, and it was very painful, but it was like 
certain places I just zoomed in on. Ephesians chapter 1 and 2, I would read sometimes 20 times a day. And then I would read Romans chapter 3, 4, and 5. I would read Philippians chapter 3. I would read the whole of John's Gospel again and again, and I'd read the whole of the first epistle of, of John. And I just, these were my favorite places. Isaiah 53, that was another one. But particularly Ephesians 1 and 2. And this was a revelation to me because it kept saying that salvation is in Christ. You're blessed with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly place in Christ. You're accepted in the beloved, verse 6. I underlined in, in my Catholic Bible how many times it said in Christ in the first two chapters. It's 42 times. Now this to me was revelation from on high. Because to me, salvation was in my heart. It was pumped in through the sacraments, making us good inside ourselves. That's my concept always, that salvation was in the human heart. And now I keep reading, and Paul's own testimony is that I may be found in him, not having my own self righteousness which is of the law. It's always in Christ. Your life is hid with Christ and God. It's, it's on and on. It's always in Christ. John's gospel is always everlasting life is in him. And John finishes chapter 5 of 1 John. This is the record that everlasting life is in him. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. Everlasting life is in him. And for somebody who has been taught it's in a church and or it's inside you, you by being good, that was just revelation from on high. And I groaned over it. It was really, it wasn't that I got convicted over it. I still believe my traditions and I still believe my sacraments, but I was struggling. It was, I would stand up at the priest conference and I'd say, well, maybe we're not just saved by sacraments and, you know, by going to communion and doing these things. Maybe God just makes us right as we trust on Christ. And they'd say, who do you think you are? Do you, Bennett, who are you? Do you think you're better than the Pope and the bishops and all millions of Catholics? Who do you think you are? And I'd say, well, I'd say, I'm like Oscar. I don't know if you knew Oscar. Oscar was on Sesame Street. Oscar, Oscar, <laughs> Oscar was the guy in the tin can, you know. And uh, we used to see Sesame Street in Trinidad, and Oscar was always coming up out of the can and saying his saying, and they'd push him down. <laughs> but Oscar would be back up again, so all I could say is, that I'm like Oscar. <laughs> I'll, I'll be back up, you know. Uh, and it was that way for my first seven years. I was like Oscar, but nothing more. But then I, I got fairly famous as a Catholic priest, and I was asked to go to Canada in um, 1979, and I was asked to speak in St. Stephen's Catholic Church in Seattle. And I was staying in a, in a Christian home because Catholics now could mix with Christians. And I was staying in this Christian home and had this big book on the shelf, Strong's Concordance. I opened it up. I asked them what it was, and they explained to me. And I looked up under Word. What does the Bible say about itself? Your word is true. Thy word is true. All scripture given by inspiration of God. Not to think beyond what is written. You know, scripture cannot be broken. And on and on. I kept reading what the Bible says about itself. To the law and the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, there's no light in them. And man, I was getting convicted that this the Bible is the authority. And I got up in St. Stephen's Church. And man, I preached it. But I was preaching to myself. <laughs> And I got back to a huge church in Canada, and I had a portable microphone, first time in my life, on my, my dress, you know, my chasuble. I was walking up and down the aisle with my Bible, and I said, this is the testimony. If you do not have this, you do not have life. And I was quoting from Scripture. 
man I was preaching to myself too and we had a big collection so I said we must have done good you know <laughs> so, so uh, but three days later Archbishop Carney called me and he used some street language and I mean, it, was, it was not like an archbishop should speak he, he, he took me apart he really pulled me over the coals he told us to go back to Trinidad I was never to preach again in his archdiocese I held my face before him and afterwards I went to a washroom and I cried my eyes out but before him <laughs> I, was, I was still stood but I was he took me apart he said you should know better the authority is, is tradition and what the church says you should know better and I went back to Trinidad but now I was different I took the statues out of the church and the archbishop got annoyed and he told me we could continue because I was friends but not to influence other priests. But then a Catholic came up and showed me a machete, you know, you know the, the, and he told me to put back the statues. <laughs> and I feared the machete. The <laughs> and I put back Jesus and Mary, but um, I didn't fear the archbishop, but I'd seen people chopped with machetes, and uh, I did fear the machete, even though I was trying to hold to the word of God, but my <laughs> I was still struggling. And uh, But the next seven years, and then a priest conference, who do you think you are? I'd say, thus says the Lord. And this is where the heat really began. It was... It was really difficult. The last seven years were extremely difficult. People used to ridicule me on the golf course. The priest would say, now pray to your Jesus to get that ball down. You know, they, they'd mock me, you know, pray to your Jesus. And um, I really struggled in those years. And I'm Irish, so I began to drink even more heavily than the Irish normally do. I was to sleep at night, so I, was, I couldn't sleep. I was really, really troubled. And it was 12, 13, now 14 years of search, and I was still having peace with God. Uh, I didn't know what to do. I went into my own office, to, and people come in for counseling, and I sat in the chair where a person comes for counseling, looking up at the priest chair, sort of trying to keep this thing objective, you know. I say, like, I have a problem, you know. I, I, I know the Bible is true. I know we're saved by grace. I know it's in Christ. It's not a church. I know that it's all of God, and it's not of us. What do I do? I don't have peace with God. I understand all of these things. It's like the advice coming back from the chair is, you're still bound by Aristotle. You think because you understand it, it's yours? That's an Aristotelian, that's a Greek philosophy. This is trusting, it's not just understanding. And then, I, but, but I still don't have peace with God. I'm like, I was waiting for, for counsel. I was like, Bennett, you've never dealt with the fact that you're dead in trespasses and sins. You've read it day after day in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. You're spiritually dead. I said, oh, man, I better be such a good priest. <laughs> I'm such a good priest now. For 14 years, I've been searching what the Bible says. I mean, I must have some brownie points. That must be, <laughs> must be some good, you know. You're spiritually dead. It was like the chair was saying back to me, get on your face before God. And that evening, it was the end of September, I think, it was 22 years ago, and it was 1985, and I got on my face before God on the carpet of the rectory. I cried out to God, show me how dead I am. God, show me. Show me that I cannot of myself and the Lord was showing me. And I was praying, give me a gift of faith that I may trust. Give me peace. Give me assurance that I'm in Christ. Forgive my sins and give me the eternal, everlasting life that you promise. And then I was saying, and yes, Father, I believe. 
I trust Christ and him alone. And I went on and on and I just started to cry. And I went down on the ground and I cried like a baby for about 15 minutes. My life was never the same again. It was the next day I fully realized that about 12 o'clock I didn't need wine to steady my nerves. At night I didn't need any drink. I had peace with God. It's about two months after that I saw that I could not continue to baptize babies, hear confessions. I could not continue to do sacraments. I knew that it was God directly saves people as they trust on him. I could not continue. I saw that I had to leave the Catholic Church and I pleaded with God in prayer. I said, I have a love for precious Catholic people. I don't want to leave them. And it was like, come out of her and be separate and I will be a father to you. And I was saying in prayer, but Father, I want to love my Catholic people. And it was like, well, love them, but come out and love them. And it was I left Catholicism with the assurance that I could always love Catholic people and that Christ would be exalted and people would see who Christ really is and see that God so loved the world, that this is God saving, this is who God is, it's not any church. Salvation is of the Lord. So that was my leaving of Catholicism in 1985. Just at this time of the year, just October, and I left and came to Canada and then I came to the United States. I had practically no money, about $400. But man, did I trust the Lord that he would look after me and that he would always give me a love for Catholics. Now down the line, he gave me a precious wife and that's a whole story in itself. I'm really sad that she's not here. Uh, if if we do if I do come back, be sure to make sure that I invite my wife too. Uh, if uh, but a precious lady. But then when we we went to China for a year, and that was eye opening. We had our Bibles and we gave the message to people. The year at Tiananmen Square. My life has been dramatic, and one of the most dramatic things was to be there when the demonstrations were going on in China and teaching in a college. Teachers College. It was an awesome year. People who would not even read a Bible at the beginning of the year. One young man who refused the Bible at the beginning of the year asked me for 19 Bibles at the end. I said, why 19? He said, there's 18 other teachers going to a, a school in a country area. I want one for each teacher and one for myself. People getting convicted and saved. It was just an awesome year. And then when I came back to the States, I did a year Bible college, and then I started the ministry I have. And I thank God I've seen precious Catholic people come to the Lord. Not only here in America, but in different language groups. And by God's grace, I've been to places like Poland and Brazil and other places, and South America, Mexico. And it's, it's just glorious to see precious Catholic people come to the Lord. It is precious, and I thank God for saving this Pharisee, <laughs> somebody dead in rituals and so devout, and so dead in, in empty religion. The Lord has been gracious. Now I'd like to go over in love and kindness what I was doing for those 14 years, and as a comparison, you have in, the, in your little booklet there, you have in questions about Catholicism, you have a chart that I have done. And if we could start on the first of this. Um, it's the basis of truth. You see it in the, it's the first comparison between Catholicism and Biblical and the Bible. We are quoting from the exact words of the Catholic Church 
the Catechism of the Catholic Church is first-hand Catholic documentation, their own translation from Latin into English, uh, published, first of all, in 1994, and then republished in the year 2000. I'm using the, actually the revised edition of the Catechism. This is first-hand Catholicism. And on the left-hand side, the scripture, the first topic is the most important topic, is the basis of truth. How do we know truth? What is truth? Christ Jesus said, scripture, the scripture cannot be broken. We've reached an absolute, something that cannot be gainsaid, cannot be spoken against, an absolute. Scripture, what is written down, cannot be broken. There's your absolute. Something cannot be spoken against or broken. The absolute is the written word, not hearsay, the written word. Christ said in his great prayer the night before he died, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. The Bible is truth. It's not simply that it contains truth. This is truth. God's word is truth. It's right through Psalm 119, the same phrase. Thy word is truth. God's word is truth. And the Apostle Paul wrote many things about the truthfulness of Scripture, but he said also, and now, brothers, I have applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit so that you may learn from us the meaning of the saying, do not go beyond what is written. The great dictum of believers right through the age is not to think beyond what is written. The scripture is our authority. We do not go beyond the authority of God. We have the mind of God, the words of God, the thoughts of God in written format. And the scripture says, add thou not unto his words or he will rebuke you and prove you a liar. It's the very last commandment in Revelation 22 not to add to or subtract from the words of the book. And the famous definition of scripture and it's, it's all sufficiency in 2 Timothy 3. All scripture is God breed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Absolutely sufficient for everything. The scriptures. Now this grieved the heart of Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus was meek and humble, but he withstood the Pharisees to their face. He called them whited sepulchres, blind leaders of the blind, because they were teaching the doctrines of men and teaching their traditions. They equally loved tradition to the written word of God. And Christ rebuked them to their face. And he said such things as, Thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you've handed down. They were nullifying the word of God that they said they loved because of their traditions. So this is a serious topic that Christ Jesus took most seriously. Now the Catholic Church has this book which is divided into paragraphs. It has page numbers but the way Catholics quote from it is the paragraphs, because that's you can give short paragraphs, so you can you can zoom in on a, a, a text like a like a Bible chapter and verse. This has paragraphs, so it's easy to quote from. So quoting from paragraph 80, sacred tradition and sacred scripture then are bound closely together and communicate one with another. They say there's some communication going on between tradition, sacred tradition and scripture. Now, you can look at any Bible and it seems to be like the Bible says itself, the faith once delivered to the saints. It's not communicating with anything, it's finished. And it's, you know, it's definitive. But the Catholic Church has this idea of communication going on between sacred tradition and sacred scripture. 
they go further, paragraph 81, and holy tradition transmits in its entirety the word of God which has been entrusted to the apostles by Christ the Lord and the Holy Spirit. Now how serious is that? That's as serious as you can get. The saying that this tradition, which they do not tell you what it is, they quote from 35 volumes of Greek and Latin fathers and 35 volumes of councils and popes and about 155 volumes of sayings and doings of saints when they quote tradition, but they never define what it is. They call it holy tradition. Transmits in its entirety the word of God. Now this is utterly serious because the scripture says holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the spirit. It was the Holy Spirit that caused men to write the word, that has given the word to believers. Paul said to the Thessalonians, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is the word of God. The Holy Spirit transmitted it to the people of God so that they knew it was the word of God. This is transmitted by the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit who uses the word to convict of sin, righteousness, and judgment and bring us to salvation. I talked to some people before the service and they were telling me about how the Lord brought them to salvation. That's the Holy Spirit convicting, using the word. It's awesome. It's not any church or any holy tradition or any tradition. It's the Holy Spirit's a person of the divine person that transmits the word of God. The conclusion is in paragraph 82. As a result, the church does not derive her certainty about all revealed truths from the Holy Scriptures alone. They tell you they do not accept the Holy Scriptures alone. That is not where they stand. That's the same with the Way International, the Mormons, the Jehovah Witnesses. A mark of a cult is that they do not accept scripture alone. That's the first mark of anything that is not biblical. But they usually don't tell you up front that they don't accept the scriptures alone. The Catholic Church, to be honest, tells you up front they do not accept the scriptures alone. Both scripture and tradition must be accepted and honored with equal sentiments of devotion and reverence. You have to show equal devotion and reverence to tradition. Now how serious is this? What is the Bible? The Bible is the word of God. It contains the thoughts of God. It gives us the mind of God. So we have a love for the scriptures more than anything else. There's no other source. There's no other authority. It's on a level by itself. Uh, it's like a man and his wife. He loves his wife like he no, loves nobody else. You know, it, that's on a special level. Our love for the word of God is on a special level. Now to say that you have equal love and reverence for tradition is paramount to a man saying to his wife, well, I love you, honey, but I have equal love and reverence for a woman down the street. You know? what would you think of that man you can't have equal love and reverence for any other woman well in a similar way you cannot have equal love and reverence for any tradition that you don't even tell us what it is that is an adulterous type of love we cannot, cannot and that is how sad it is now if you're a Catholic here or listening to this later on this is painful. I used to say it was like a razor blade across the pupil of my eye when I was studying this as a priest. It was painful. If it's painful, I know what the pain is. Bear with the pain and accept the truth. It is painful. But this is where salvation begins with every believer, is that you have an absolute. Scripture cannot be broken. God's word is truth. You've got to come there. That's where Christ Jesus stood. That's where the apostles stood. That's where the believers have always stood right through history. 
The second topic is salvation by grace alone. This is equally serious because God is all holy. How are we right before the all holy God? How can we, how can we stand before God? And we are told in Romans 3 verse 24, and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. The previous verse said, for all have sinned and come short of the, pre the glory of God. Everybody is a sinner. And this is the answer, being justified freely by his grace. It's free without payment, utterly free to you, and free to me. Is it paid for? Yes, indeed, it's paid for through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. Christ paid the price, the redemption, by his perfect life and his perfect sacrifice, utterly paid for. He took the wrath of God for sin on the cross, utterly paid for sin but it is free to you. Summarize in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast. It's God's gift. It comes through faith. It's all of him. And in Romans 5, it tells us about God's abundant provision of grace, the gift of righteousness, reign in life to one man, Jesus Christ. It's the abundance of grace, the riches of grace. It's always the abundance because it's our gracious God who saves us. That's just a few of these uh, verses showing that it is utterly God's grace. What does the Catholic Church say? They give a definition on, uh, in paragraph 2021. They say, grace is the help God gives us to respond to our vocation of becoming his adopted sons. It introduces us into the intimacy of the Trinitarian life. Grace is no longer who God is, the abundance of grace, the riches of grace. It's merely a help. It's something you respond to, so you're in the driving seat. You respond to it. In scripture, grace is who our God is. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's not a help, that's who God is. It's who God is to save. It's not merely a help or a tool or something you use. Like a man would use his blackened deck or power drill or a woman would use an iron to iron her husband's shirt. This is not something you use or a help. This is who God is. This is the graciousness of God. This is not reduced to being a, a help. And then how the help comes, how grace comes, is defined in paragraph 1129. The church affirms that for believers, the sacraments of the new covenant are necessary for salvation. They talk about their seven sacraments are necessary. You cannot be saved without baptism, confirmation, Eucharist, penance, you know, matrimony, holy orders, and anointing of the sick. You know, the seven sacraments, you, you, you ne they're necessary. What does the scripture say? What did, what did Paul and Silas say to the jailkeeper when he said, what must I do to be saved? He said, believe on the Lord Jesus and thou shalt be saved thou in thy household. It was believe on the Lord Jesus. He was trusting his person, his work, the Lord Jesus. It wasn't any church. The Catholic Church says that her physical sacraments are necessary. And then they say sacramental grace is the grace of the Holy Spirit given by Christ and proper to each sacrament. It's hard for me to read these words because this is utter blasphemy in the strictest sense. Sacramental grace is the grace of the Holy Spirit. It's talking about Holy Spirit power 
They say it's the power that comes from the sacraments, is Holy Spirit power. That's the definition of blasphemy, is to speak against the Holy Spirit. Scripture says all sins will be forgiven except to speak against the Holy Spirit. You cannot speak against the Holy Spirit and think you get away with it. God will not be mocked. That's as serious as you can get to say that your power is Holy Spirit power. It's interesting that this was written for the first time in 1992 in Latin. First translation in English was 1994. It was around that time that the embryo, the beginning of Boston Globe exposing the inner heart of Catholicism in the life of the priests began to be exposed. The Boston Globe began revealing the scandals of the Catholic Church. It was taken up by the Dallas Morning News and then newspaper after newspaper from Hong Kong to New Zealand to Australia to Poland, right across the world. Right across the world. In the late 90s and in the early part of the 2000s, the inner heart of Catholicism was revealed. God will not be mocked. You cannot speak against the Holy Spirit and expect that you will be left just as it was before. I think that was one of the horrific things that was ever written down. I think the Catholic Church is still paying for it, but I thank God. I thank God that many Catholics in agony have come to see that there must be some place where, where pastors actually live the Christian message and there's not all these horrendous scandals. Just recently the 60 million in LA, before that Portland, Oregon going bankrupt and Spokane going bankrupt and so many dioceses, millions upon millions, just paying for the, the victims where it has been proven of, this, of the horrendous evil that has gone forth. I hate speaking about these things, but we have got to. And to realize that you cannot speak against the Holy Spirit and expect that it will just go on as usual. It is difficult to read, but we have got to read it and we've got to, we've got to see that it's the Holy Spirit that convicts us of sin and brings us to God and it's his personal work and it's not power coming from any ritual. Three is the faith, trusting in God by faith. And faith is precious, what I said already, what Paul said to the jailkeeper, believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your house. Philippians 1.29, for it's been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but to suffer for him. It's granted to you. It's a gift of God. Faith is given to you. Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. It comes through the written word of God, the word of Christ. And we could go on and on. Faith is centered on Christ. The object is Christ. It's God-given. We trust on Christ for salvation. You'd say that's so clear it could not be twisted. The Catholic Church has different ways of focusing in on faith, and we've got to read the exact words. Paragraph 168, quotation, it is the Church that believes first and so bears, nourishes, and sustains my faith. So Mother Church believes first. So this is the Catholic Church focusing a different way. The following paragraph, salvation comes from God alone, but because we receive the life of faith through the church, she is our mother. The focus has changed even more to you looking at Mother Church. And paragraph 181, 
Believing is an ecclesial act, a church act, an ecclesial act. The church's faith precedes, engenders, and supports our faith. Engenders means it gives life to. So the church precedes faith, engenders, and supports our faith. The church is the mother of all believers. No one can have God as father who does not have a church as mother. Now they say that you cannot have God as your father if the Catholic Church is not your mother. So you end up by believing in Holy Mother Church. When I was convicted in 1985 and wrote back to my family, I made cassette tapes the days before email, you know, and I made cassette tapes and told my fa they said, you've fallen from the faith, you've lapsed from the faith. You no longer believe in Holy Mother. That's the way Catholics believe in Holy Mother Church. I tried to tell them I don't believe in any church. <laughs> I believe in a person. I believe in Christ Jesus. They wouldn't listen to me. They said, you've fallen from the faith. That's the way the Catholics, it's drilled into them. It's Mother Church. You believe Mother Church. And they're so bold as to say you cannot have God as Father if you do not have the church as mother. How arrogant can you get? It is frightening. The next topic is actually the most serious topic on the whole chart, and that is the All Holy One, because it's the defining characteristic of God. God is the All Holy One. God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, unchangeable as being wisdom, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. That's a quick definition of what God is, his nature. Not who God is, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, but his nature, what God is, the attributes of God. But of all these attributes, holiness is the most decisive because it's the defining attribute. His love is holy, his truth is holy, his justice is holy, all about him is holy because he is the all-holy one. He is distinguished from every creature and everything is made because he is the only all-holy one. And so the scripture could say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Who will not fear thee, O Lord, and bring glory to your name for you alone are holy. There is none holy as the Lord, there is none besides you. And on and on I could give scripture after scripture. I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to idols. We could go on scripture after scripture, because God is the only all-holy one. This defines who God is. Again, you would think that this is so clear that nobody could ever write against this. The Catholic Church does say that God is the All-Holy One, but they also declare paragraph 2677 by asking Mary to pray for us. We acknowledge ourselves to be poor sinners and we address ourselves to the Mother of Mercy, the All-Holy One. I read this to a Catholic once. He said, my church does not say that. And I gave him the book. And he was horrified. It was in L.A. He was protesting at a conference in John MacArthur's church. I was one of the speakers. My church does not say that. I said, read the book. He came in and was counseled by John MacArthur. And as far as we could see afterwards, the Lord gloriously saved him. He said, my church does not say that. I would to God that no church ever dared say that. They call Mary the All-Holy One. And paragraph 20, 30 says, and from the church he learns the example of holiness and recognizes that model and source in the All-Holy Virgin, Mary. They say Mary is the source. Now holiness is transmitted to us in justification, in sanctification, and finally in glorification. That's how God shares his holiness with us. We're first of all justified, then we are sanctified in this life, and we'll be finally glorified in heaven. 
But that comes from God. God so loved the world, being justified freely by his grace. It's not any human person, it's God's work. They say the source is the old holy virgin. I thank God that Mary, who was a wonderful believer, blessed among women forever, a model for men and women, she in heaven does not know these things because it would not be heaven for her if she knew what they were saying about her. I mean, you could not enjoy heaven if you, heard, if you were reading what, what they said about you, you know, to make you the all holy one and that you were the source of holiness. It's unbelievable, but that's what the Catholic Church says. Now, I don't, if you are a believer, I don't think that you should begin witnessing the Catholics by saying this, but sometimes we've got to play hardball. <laughs> we've got to say, read the Catholic Church in its own writings. Deal with it. It's hard. It's, it's hard. I know it's hard. I know it's painful. I went through 14 years of pain and struggle. But God brings you through and he shows you the glorious salvation in him and that you're saved before the one all holy God and there's none like unto him. Um, I'll have to do very quickly because we're, we're a bit short in time the idolatry issue. You know the commandment we're not to make any graven image or to serve them. The commandment is explained in Deuteronomy 4 where it says, you saw no form of any kind on the day the Lord spoke to you at whore about of the fire, therefore watch yourselves very carefully. Do not corrupt yourselves and make yourselves an idle image of any shape. The definition of the graven image is a form or shape of the divine. The word explains the word of God. We're not to make artwork of Father, Son, or Spirit. And that's the way believers saw it in the early church, the way all the believers saw it at the Reformation, with the exception of some of the Lutherans, all saw that we do not make pictures of Father, Son, or Holy Spirit. The real century of dispute was the 8th century, the iconoclastic century, where the Orthodox and the Catholic Church formally accepted that we should make images of Christ. So it's... Um, believers have always been consistent not to make pictures or images of Father, Son, or Spirit, because that's the way the Bible defines it. The Catholic Church says, paragraph 21, 32, Christian veneration of images is not contrary to the first commandment which prescribes idols. Indeed, the honor rendered to an image passes to his prototype. Whoever venerates an image venerates the person portrayed in it. You go through it as a medium back to the person. That's what Aaron did in worshipping the golden calf. He said, let's make a feast to the God of Israel. He was using it as a medium. That's why he was condemned. That's the reason why people are condemned. We do not use a physical thing as a medium. And then they go on to give the historical reasons why God changed his mind, as it were. Idolatry is a serious issue, and we do not compromise. The last topic I'll deal with really quickly, it's uh, God is God, only God hears prayers. You can read your Bible from cover to cover, people only pray to God. When Saul called up the dead, you know, he was condemned for it. You know what I mean? We do not consult the dead. We do not talk to the dead. We only pray to God, cover to cover in the Bible. But the Catholic Church talks about communion with the dead. And I give the exact paragraph numbers. The very last quotation is, we can and should ask them to intercede for us and the whole world. It's not just that it's permissible. You should commune with the dead and ask them to intercede for us in the whole world. We do not commune with the dead. That's a definition for the occult. We do not commune with anybody but God. It's really sad. And again, I don't apologize for how difficult it is. We've got to deal with it. It is difficult, but 
we do not pray except to God. That's a simple Bible truth. I am the Lord thy God. I will not have strange God before me. If you think a saint can hear you in any language, you're giving them divine attributes. If you think that Mary can hear you in any language, you're giving her divine attributes. We do not treat anybody as God. We only treat God as God. Now, this has been a difficult presentation and it pains me um, but I, I say these things in love because it's difficult but we have to realize I say it with all love to a Catholic person here that you come here and you're in pain I know the pain it's, it really is difficult it really is difficult but cry out to God he is faithful. Ask him to open your eyes. Take away the pain. Show you Christ exalted. Show you salvation in him. Show you that you're dead in sin. And give you the faith to trust him in what he has given in, in salvation. And he will graciously save you. And you will never be the same again. Praise God. Now, if there's somebody here, and often I do meet these people that say to me, I'm born Catholic, I'm going to die Catholic. You know, I'm in Mother Church, and I'm going to die in Mother Church. Who are you to talk about against Holy Mother Church? What do I say to you? I say what Christ said to the devout Pharisees. The Pharisees were equally devout. They loved their religion. And when Christ looked at them, he talked to them face to face. You get it in the exact words in John's Gospel, chapter 8, verse 24. He said to them, If you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Christ talking strongly to the Pharisees who were utterly devout. If you don't believe that I am he, I am the Messiah, I am the one who was sent, you will die in your sins. Go to hell for eternity. And I say that to the devout Catholic who says, I'll never change. Okay. You'll die in your sins. You'll go to hell. Religion never saved anyone. It's hard. I was saying this once in, in Virginia, and one man, and he, he had a tear in his as I, and Afterwards, he, told, he said, Richard, that, that's the end of me. He said, I thank God. It was the, it's, it's actually a, it's a video on our webpage at the moment called The Unveiling of the, of the um, Catholicism and the, the um, Papacy. It's a strong video, but at the very end, there was a Catholic there, and I knew he was a Catholic, and he was devout, and I said that at the very end. Oh, man, the Lord used it. He said afterwards, Richard, where do I go? I can't go back. I trust in Christ alone. And I pray that that will be the way for some of you in pain tonight, that the Lord will graciously, graciously show you his love and that you will know and rejoice in him and give praise to him all the days of your life and for all eternity. Amen and amen. Praise God. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Praise God. Well, we um, we do have a time, some time for a few questions that were submitted this last week. And uh, Richard, again, thank you so much for your uh, your words today and and. Uh, just thank you for your heart, too, just for God and for, for people, not just Catholics, but all people. And so thank you so much. Uh, I mentioned last, over this last week, I received a lot of comments from uh, the, the last class we had. And um, here's some of the questions that came. And, and uh, let me just throw these out to you, if I could. And uh, one is, who wrote the Catholic teachings? Where, where do they originate, uh, the catechism? Where did this all come from? Yeah. Well, the present catechism, the catechism of the Catholic Church was written by the present Pope when he was Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger. He wrote it on the authority of the 
last pope together with cardinals and bishops and theologians from across the world. So this was written by the present pope when he was Cardinal Ratzinger. The imprimatur still gives his name as the one who said it without error.